Namaste. Because I can't use the computer very much, I have to just speak directly from my experience. And uh, we've been going into the four states of consciousness here recently. Here's the good old chart. Four states of consciousness. And the question that comes up all the time is, how do I measure my spiritual progress? Well, you measure it differently in the four states of consciousness. What a concept. <laughs> because they're so fundamentally different views of reality that the means both of spiritual advancement and of measuring or gauging your progress are completely different. That's why I said sex, love, nothingness, or darkness, and light are the four means of gauging your progress. All right, what do I mean by that? Well, honestly, how satisfied are you with your sex life? Seriously. I mean, without any filters, without any posing, without trying to meet any external um, standards or anything, how satisfied are you with your sex life? And the answer is probably going to be not completely. And the solution to that is by performing sadhana and puja, you amass sufficient pious credits, good karma, that you can understand that no human being can give you an adequate, perfect sex life. No human mate, no human companion. I mean, maybe, you know, for a few days or a few weeks, but not permanently, and certainly not throughout the different stages of life. As you age, your tastes and needs change. Hopefully they expand and uh, grow to encompass more varieties of experience. But you have to grow, you have to be able to grow together with your partner. Anyway, I found at a rather early age, in my early 20s, came to this realization that no human being is going to be adequate for me as a partner. And so then from that I made the determination to get into full-time spiritual life. I wanted to be a full-time sadhu. I approached my spiritual master, my Adi Guru, he invited me to India, and I went to India in 1972 for the first time, and again in 74 and 76. <laughs> I would go, stay for a year or so, and then come back, work, earn some money, save up, and go again. And during that period, I don't know how to say this, that it doesn't sound out of this world, crazy, pretentious, or whatever, but God appeared to me as the perfect partner. It was in India in 1975-76 in Mayapur, West Bengal, during crazy, intense kirtans that went on for hours. You see, in those days, the ISKCON Hare Krishna movement actually believed its own philosophy <laughs> and practiced the kirtans to an extreme degree, and it worked. It very much worked. And so I started getting glimpses during these kirtans, visions of a lion-like creature, <laughs> really kind of half man, half lion, Narasimha. This is a type of spiritual being. 
And yes, of course, there's one famous incarnation of Vishnu in this form, but there are thousands and millions of Narasimhas, especially in the subtle worlds. So this Narasimha, and at first I mistook him for Narasimha Dev, uh, the incarnation, but then it came out later that he was not Vishnu at all. Actually, he was Shiva. <laughs> but we'll get to that. And this started to lead to a relationship with the divine, a love relationship. And not just any love relationship, but the perfect love relationship for me, according to my personal tastes which are rather unusual and extreme, I admit, because I've been practicing Tantra since I was 13 years old. But that's another story. You have to find your perfect relationship and divine partner. And actually, you have to attract that divine partner by meditating on your ideal perfect relationship, the emotions, the feelings, the moods, and so on. And he or she will appear at some point. It's a blessing. It's a gift. It's a come hither. <laughs> and this leads to love, real love, not the kind of negotiation on the mental platform with some other person with a different agenda and different tastes and so on and so on and so on that we have in the gross world, the world of uh, the external senses. But the ideal love, the perfect love, the dream, huh? the dream that everybody gives up when they're an adolescent and their first love affair fails. But if you don't give it up, if you instead sublimate it and make it subtle and bring it from the bodily senses into the mind, then this relationship with the divine in the form of a subtle self-realized or even a Godhead uh, as a partner can happen and you will attract them and they will appear to you. And this is bhakti, this is real bhakti. This is not the formal uh, textbook, stilted, repetitious, uh, ritualistic, uh, you know, going by the book type bhakti. That's only the very, very introductory level of bhakti. But real bhakti, spontaneous and increasingly satisfying and exciting bhakti with the divine partner who is exactly the type of being you need to reach your full potential. And by this time, you should have already worked out all your sexual issues and be um, completely satisfied in that regard. Not from an earthly partner, but with a divine partner, either a form or uh, expansion of the personality of Godhead or one of the uh, realized devotees. So in my case, this lion-like creature, this Narasimha, is uh, an expansion of Shiva, and he is one of the servants of Shakti. If you read the Shakti literature, the Shakta Shakti, the Shakti Shakta Shastras, <laughs> say that quick ten times, you will find that she has thousands and millions of lions, and they help her whenever she goes to fight with the demons. They're her troops, you know, talk about shock and awe. You know, how would you feel if a million lions poured out of the sky, all out to get you? <laughs> you know, demons don't have much chance against her. But anyway, 
She is also the one who appeared to me in 1984 and gave me my first real vision of Brahman. So she can bless you. She can give you anything, you know? And uh, it just so happens I have Mars exalted in my chart at 28 degrees Sagittarius. And every astrologer who looks at me and looks at my chart says, oh, you're rich, right? You're like Bill Gates. You have a million, billion, zillion, whatever. And I, no, no, no. That's not interesting to me at all. Beyond my immediate needs, you know, or maintenance, I don't really care about money. Money is an abstraction. It's a fiction. It's a, a pretension. <laughs> it's a fabrication. Don't need money. Need facilities and tools and the bare necessities of life. That's all. So, all right. After she came and revealed herself and showed me the Brahman, my relationship with the lion got really intense. And it remained so for quite some time. And this led to extremely deep experiences of spiritual love with him and Ma Shakti, who is like my mother, my best friend, and everything to me. And then this led to coming to the uh, feet of Shiva. She promised me in a dream this is what she would, where she would bring me, and she did. She brought me to the feet of Shiva. And in Shiva, I recognized the source of my lion. It was him all the time. So what is the aim of worship of Shiva? Well, it's Sushupti consciousness. Just like Bhakti is Svapna consciousness. Uh, Sushupti is about emptiness, about nothingness, about the void. And so if you realize Sushupti, you realize nothingness. Now, what is nothingness? It's a lot of people misunderstand it. Or emptiness. Well, imagine space. Space is frictionless, unconditioned. Nothing will stick to it. <laughs> it expands in all directions. And no one part of space can be distinguished from any other part of space. It's all absolutely identical, uniform, wherever you go, changeless, and unmodifiable, can't be affected by anything. So imagine a space that's so big, so unlimited, that this whole cosmic creation can simply uh, disappear in some tiny little corner without a trace. That's space. That's not nothingness yet. That's not emptiness yet. Space still has dimension, time, measurement, extension in various directions. You see, the possibility of things coming into it and being hosted in it, and which happens all the time. Uh, but so this is not nothingness. Not this is not emptiness. Emptiness or nothingness is where there is no even space, no dimension, no measurement. No, it doesn't host anything. It's never an effect of anything. It's completely transcendental, completely empty. And not only that, it does not give any possibility of anything coming into being, coming into existence. That's emptiness. <laughs> That's really nothingness. Huh? So 
This is as beyond space as space is beyond matter. But anyway, that is the ultimate realization of Shiva, of emptiness. So that's why I said darkness. The realization of emptiness is darkness, nothingness. And then realization of Brahman, of Turiya, is light. A light that's changeless and without qualities and without boundaries and infinite. And it's just like emptiness except it's fullness. <laughs> It's the opposite. So, you have to reach the full potential of your sexual and emotional relationships before you can reach these higher stages. And you can only do that with a divine partner because human partners just, you just can't do it. It's structurally impossible. It might happen now and then accidentally, but it's not something you can build your uh, life on or build your spiritual advancement on or with. It's just something that might happen by chance, by favorable circumstances, and then the circumstances change. That's the material world. So. The spiritual world is not subject to change. The subtle world of svapna consciousness, I mean, it can change, but it doesn't have to change. It's a completely neutral ground for mental constructions and fabrications. And what to speak of emptiness, emptiness never changes, and neither does Brahman, because neither of them admit time, or duality. So, these are the ways that you check on your spiritual advancement. By sex, by love, by darkness, and finally, by light. And I hope these have helped you to guide yourself to higher and higher states of being and realization. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya.